the U.S. Sustainability and VISTA Sustainability Initiatives Program at Hawaii CC and UH Hilo, the Tropical Conservation Biology and Environmental Science Graduate Program at UH Hilo, Iola Haloa Hawaii Lifestyles Program at Hawaii CC, Kipuka Native Hawaiian Student Center at UH Hilo, Pacific Inter for Exploring Science Pipes at UH Hilo, STEM at UH Hilo, and the Sustainability Committees of UH Hilo and Hawaii CC. The theme for the Lahonua Symposium is Wanana Ikamauliola, Projecting and Manifesting a Thriving Earth. The session you're in right now is Reimagining Invasive Species and will be presented to you today by Akutagawa. Um, unfortunately, Uncle Raj won't be joining us today. He's not feeling well, so we're sending him our best wishes today. My name is Anya Benavides. And I'll be serving as moderator for this session with the assistance and support from Navin Tagore Erwin and also Michelle Shui, who will be moderating the chat for us. We ask that you try your best to remain in this session until it ends. If you must leave early, that's no problem, but please do so as discreetly as possible. If you have any questions or feedback during the session, feel free to use the chat and I'll pose them to the presenters at the end of this presenter at the end of the session. Um, and we're also inviting you to ask questions throughout the session. So please um, post any questions when you feel compelled to ask them. Um, we want it to be a dialogue. So please um, ask questions whenever. And um, we are so privileged and honored to have uh, Auntie Malia with us here today to share with us. And we ask that our audience is attentive and respectful. You'll eventually be emailed a survey, which will also be available um, on our Lahonua website. We would love to receive your feedback about your Lahonua experience. And with that, I am going to turn things over to Navin as he's going to share a short introduction on invasive species in Hawaii. Mahalo again for your support for Lahonua. Okay. Mahalo, Anya. So before we get started, I'm just going to briefly go over some terminology about canoe, native, and invasive species to help us get a little bit more oriented around the subject matter today. So first is canoe. Canoe species are plants and animals that were brought here millennia ago by Hawaii's ancestral voyagers. Um, these are like subsistence staples like lo'i, I mean not lo'i, kalo, um, ulu, tea, maya, pua'a, chickens, and stuff like that. Also plants for la'au, lapa'au purposes as well. So moving on, there's actually two types of native species. There are endemic and indigenous species. So endemic species are species like um, wili wili and monk seals that are only found in Hawaii. And then there are indigenous species, which are species like palapalai, which are found in Hawaii, but also elsewhere in the world. And for the, the main subject of today's session, we'll be talking about invasives. So invasive species are introduced species that are uh, damaging to the ecosystems they're found in. So these are things like albizia, big canopy trees, halicoa, uh, California grass, uh, those giant African snails are a good example as well. So with that, I will turn it over to Malia Okutagawa to introduce herself and uh, talk a little bit about her origin story. Malia? Oh, Nevin, Anya, and Michelle, thank you for inviting me here. So uh, my name is Malia Okutagawa. Uh, I come from the island of Molokai. I am an associate professor of law and Hawaiian studies at University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, being born and raised on Molokai, one of, one of the kind of key things of our lifestyle in Molokai is it's very um, subsistence, traditional subsistence oriented and um, the majority of the population are native Hawaiian. And so, um, <clears throat> and the island is very rural, only 7,000 people on the island. So a lot of us grew up living off of the land. Um, I come from a family of hunters and fishermen, and I principally um, am more of an ocean person, uh, oh, gathering limu yeah. with my grandmother and spearing fish along the um the coastline with we have the longest contiguous reef system and 
some of the issues we deal with on the island is uh, we have a lot of siltation on the reefs um, and in our fish ponds, our ancient fish ponds, um, from a lot of the ungulates like deer, cattle, goats, and pig. But right now, the, the most major contributing factor, I believe, is mostly from, you know, past cattle ranching and today mainly the deer population, which is, um, has exploded on Molokai due to some kind of unsustainable hunting practices, I would say. Um, but being raised on eating deer, goat, and wild pig throughout my life, as well as eating fish and limu and other things from the sea, I, I have a kind of affinity for both resources, Molokai and Makai. And while um, the species that we rely on are considered invasive, um, they were introduced like 150 years ago. They were in, introduced like in the 1800s, I would say late 1800s, mid to late 1800s. So for us, um, they have become an, an integral part of our traditional subsistence lifestyle. So there is sort of some tension on, you know, what do we prioritize in terms of um, saving our native forests versus ensuring that we have enough uh, meat from the mountain? Um, or is there some kind of sweet spot? So I've dedicated a lot of my, I don't know, maybe the last uh, like eight years trying to figure it out um with my community as the deer population has expanded and as we look at preserving the our native upland forest through conservation fencing actually i've been dealing with it for quite a while since two since 19 i would say 1997 i'm from the uh, kamalo on the east side and i was involved as a community member when the first uh, fencing went up in Kamalo. So that's kind of a, on a rough background about me. Uh, I don't know if you're... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what I'm about to say. Oh, there is. All right. Oh, no. Any you going? Sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry about that, everyone. Mahalo, Malia, for your, your background and origin story. I know you, you kind of got into it already, but um, could you expand about your uh, relationship with Access Day specifically and uh, maybe some of the work that you've been, you've been working on these past eight, nine years with them? Um, you know, I could actually show a PowerPoint if you guys want. Um, that kind of describes more deeply the work I did um, when we're looking at the watershed management project and trying to figure out traditional practices and rights. Um, if you want me to do that. You can share a screen. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. So this is something I had to show in one of the Hawaiian studies classes, but we're dealing with, um, you know, really strong emotions around um, hunting as, and conservation. And the initial battle started with the pig snaring um, that happened, I think was in the 1990s. Uh, Nature Conservancy, which is our principal conservation organization on Molokai. They're putting up snares uh, in, in areas where hunters, uh, kind of more remote areas where hunters have difficulty reaching um, without, you know, having hunting cabins where they can stay overnight and climb some more or just areas that are really uh, precarious, yeah. But what was happening with the snaring was Nature Conservancy wasn't 
uh, monitoring their snares. And so a lot of the animals died and the meat was being wasted. And sometimes they were, um, you know, they contaminated the streams, their bodies. And so there was a group called, uh, I think Pono, Pono and they, they were advocating for Pono hunting and that Nature Conservancy work with hunters. Um, it got kind of bad to the point where the hunters contacted PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And then it became kind of a national like embarrassment for Nature Conservancy. Um, Uncle Walter Ritty, he was kind of leading this group and he's a you know staunch Native Hawaiian activist. And so he kind of put a spotlight on this issue and Peter ad, um, put a big ad, like a poster board, giant poster board thing showing um, this pig that, mo mother pig that was snared um, and her, she was pregnant and all her fetuses were aborted and uh, they took a, a bag full of the bones of this, of pigs that were strewn throughout the landscape in the North Valley of Pelekunu. And they, they put this giant poster board of the picture, um, I think in New York on Macy's uh, shopping mall and strewn the pig bones all, all over the sidewalk and put a caption saying the Nature Conservancy. So that's how bad it was. This was pre-internet days, so you can't find this picture, but um, it began to uh, kind of change the behavior of Nature Conservancy to work more closely with community. Um, and so they started with this East Molokai Watershed Partnership in Kamalo, where I'm from. Um, Kamalo is kind of like, um, just to kind of give you, so this is the east coast of Molokai. This is Kamalo. This is the um, this is the big uh, Kiha or Mo'o, the large lizard mountain. And so they fence these areas up here to protect the native um, uh, native upland forests. Yeah, and hired. Um, Molokai, uh, Native Hawaiian and local uh, men to erect a fence line. It was, this area is really, really steep. So this kind of shows you like the outline of the fence. Um, and then this is below the fence line. So you can see all this area is really um, degraded. And then this part is the native forest that was saved. Um, and there was, it was actually a pretty good partnership. Uh, it involved people from Kamalo area, including um, my uncle and myself. And they had partnered with the community to do community hunts. There were also the major landowners were Kamehameha Schools and Kapuale Ranch. And so they allowed our hunters to go on their lands and hunt to bring the population down. At the time, the goats were the most prevalent uh, in this area. Now the goats have, numbers have declined and now it's more deer. Um, but, you know, I spoke to a hunter um, who, is Daniel, I forget his last name, but he's the, Vice you can't bring any more leaven into the house. The vice president of the created your cereal boxes in your car. And he was part of the fencing. He he was part of the fencing crew. And he says, you know, he was glad to be part of that initiative. So you have hunters here who are also supporting the fence line. But then a con the controversy arised when Nature Conservancy in 2014 proposed to fence almost the entire East End. And so uh, there were concerns like, okay, what does this mean for our hunters? You know, will they have access? Um, 
And so a lot of hunters, they're poachers because it's hard to get um, any private landowner to give people permission to hunt. And, and so it became a big controversy and the Ahakiole, which is a kind of indigenous governance system on Molokai. Um, it's, a, it's a group I'm part of as well. And um, I was a po'o, the lead for the island for several years up until recently. Uh, at the time I wasn't in the Ahakiole leadership, but the Office of Hawaiian Affairs kind of intervened uh, when the Ahakiole asked for help. And then, then Office of Hawaiian Affairs contacted my, uh, contacted me being from Molokai. And so I got my law students uh, through our Native Find Rights Clinic project to assist. And what we did was, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that um, we were able to document traditional and customary Hawaiian rights. Um, and, and so we did intake forms and interviews of Kama'aina people from the area of Mana'e, which is over 30 ahupa'a um, on a really small stretch of land. The ahupa'a are really narrow, but we really wanted to kind of get a sense from them what their practices were, what, um, you know, and we basically operationalized this framework by asking them, okay, this is a legal framework for the protection of native rights where you do an assessment of traditional and customary Hawaiian practices taking place in a subject area, evaluate impacts of a proposed action on those practices and then mitigate harm to native Hawaiian rights and practices. So the case law basically says that um, when you wanna determine what is Hawaiian custom, you ask the kama'aina, you ask the native Hawaiian uh, tenants of these ahupa, what is the practice? So we wanted to operationalize this process or our, our interviews were really about trying to determine, okay, um, what natural and cultural resources exist in Mana'e, in East Molokai, um, and what is the current health of these resources? And what do you think the impacts would be from the fencing um, along the Vau'akua and the Vau'nahele, the um, upper areas with the permanent cloud forests? Um, and and what, what, what do you think the impacts will be to your rights and practices? And then what do you recommend to do to make it formal? And so, um, we, we did the interviews and we did mapping. We wanted them to kind of identify the general areas where they fish, hunt, and gather, where the trails were, um, places that they gathered la'au, lapa'au, medicinal herbs, uh, lay, uh, uh, lay making materials and things they gathered for food. Um, and so we found like, these are like the different ahupua names. And we found that in every ahupua, there was some kind of traditional subsistence or religious uh, ceremonial things that were being done. So this, this indicated to us how robust these practices continue to be. And then we wanted to see what they were hunting gathering, fishing. And so these are some of the things that they listed in the intake forms. And then we, we kind of wanted to see what was the availability of subsistence foods. And so they were saying like, where the Kamalo fence was, they, they saw the, <clears throat> the white crab return and they saw some limu return, um, but they saw like the lower forests resources um, diminishing. They were saying the moisture in the air is less, so they don't see the pepeau, the, the tree fungus that is a delicacy. Um, you know, they were saying like all the, the, 
the fish ponds and the reefs are being silted over. So there, there's degrading ahupa'a health. One of the things too, they witnessed like even though the, in Kamalo, the, the upper rainforest was intact, there was further degrading of the lower parts of the ahupua, which added to the silt. Um, so there was really a need to coordinate the work. And then in areas where there was no fence, it was continued de degradation, yeah. They also said that a lot of the stream resources were being degraded um, and like Oopu, so this is the Oopu and this is Hihivai. These are the major stream areas and the Java plum was overcrowding uh, the, the stream habitat and overshading, but there was also, you know, the lands above were degraded. So there's a lot of flash flooding and the flash flooding killed the Oopu. The Oopu look for heavy rains to wash them down into the estuary, into the bay. And that's how they mate. But with the flash flooding, um, the Oopu perished. And so these are some of the things that people were observing. And, you know, they also identified certain trails and easements and, um, and tradition for traditional access areas that we needed to protect. So these are certain trails they identified, Makomakai trails. And they talked about many historic and cultural sites that could be impacted and would be impacted by the, by the fence line. Um, one of the things was, when you look at this map, there were certain gap areas where large landowners did not agree to be to have their place fenced. And so there was concern of a corridor being um, made where the, the animals would travel further east to find these sort of gap areas. And so there was like, uh, this is like in the Wailua area where there's a lot of streams and there's no county water. So people rely on the streams for their domestic and agriculture uses. And, and then there, were, this is another area uh, where the fence wasn't gonna be. And so these were, there were like certain historic cultural sites like this uh, apu for the ava bowls that was carved into the stone. Um, so there were a lot of concerns like um, also about, you know, hunting, access for hunting. And so some people were saying like, you know, this is Moloka Inuya Hina, great child of Hina. Are we saying we're okay about letting this great child of Hina die by too much ungulates on the land? Or, you know, are, are we going to give priority to hunting? Um, and so we had to kind of balance these things and figure out what to do, yeah? And we tried to see, is there like common ground? Um, and, and so we, we wanted to try and find what is this sweet spot, yeah? And so, um, you know, we wanted to figure out how do we, we um, address these internal conflicts. And these are Native Hawaiians um, having, you know, good mana'o from both sides, yeah? Some were saying, we got to lower the fence to protect the lower rainforest. I mean, the lower forest, the vaula'au. Um, and then you had hunters that were being arrested, you know, and they're saying all my life I've been jumping over fences to hunt and feed my family. I don't like see any more fences. And so, so what happened? We, we basically found like, okay, there was some kind of common ground. One, people agreed something needed to be done. Some said, hey, fencing is a tool, but not the only tool. Um, we should adopt, um, you know, smaller fencing units 
build what you, we can manage and adjust our management approach over time as we, as we learn from management in these smaller fencing units. Um, and we talked about how we can integrate the community more in the, in the um, restoration work and the man and the management and where hunters can actually be part of a solution you know so one of the things nature conservancy provided was a step overs on these fences along the fence line for people to hunt um and and there was also talk about having hunting cabins um especially when you know it's a long, it's a long walk and you gotta, you gotta stay overnight um, and utilize these hunting cabins also for conservation workers. Um, and then there was also this uh, mana'o from the hunters that a lot of the younger hunters are just have buck fever. They only want to hunt for the big racks and what, what was happening and they were wasting the meat. So there is a indication of an erosion of Hawaiian cultural values where, you know, you, you basically don't waste meat, you eat what you can get, you don't be, you know, you're not about getting the prize buck, you're about getting meat. And so what, what, what's been happening and as I've been interviewing more hunters, you know, more recently beyond this, um, research we did in 2014 was what, what's contributed to the population explosion is that one, you got the big, the big bucks getting um, eliminated. So now you have the spikes, which in, in reality wouldn't even been able to mate with the does. And so now the gene pool is getting really, um, is getting lessened. So you see kind of smaller deer and more deformed and the big bucks used to um, regulate when, when the mating happened. So, so now with the spikes mating with the does, they're basically um, mating and birthing year round. When it used to be more like twice a year. So now you have this population explosion. You're not, you're not killing enough out of those. You're killing the, the big box. You're weakening the gene pool. They're also, they're also becoming more tame. The deer are, are kind of crafty, you know, they, they, they adjust to hunting pressure. So now they're going to the residences and farms. And as the, as the population explodes, and especially in the summer months, we had this famine. What was happening was <clears throat> there was not enough vegetation. It was dry. There was no water. You also had um, Molokai Ranch on the West End uh, that kind of phase, was phasing out cattle ranching. So they stopped putting water in their troughs. So then there was a big die off of deer on the West End. And what happened was um, they became so emaciated and the, the, the stench was, you could smell a stench of dead rotting deer carcasses. Um, and they were coming to the road. They're even going to the open sewage water uh, ponds at, um, on the west end where Molokai Ranch is located and they were drinking the sewage water. They were going to residences. Um, they're in the middle of towns and homes, eating the grass, e eating every little piece of vegetation they could find, including plants that were poisonous to them. They began to eat that. And some of them would just come up to you and just with their eyes be begging you to just kill them. And then the does were aborting their fetuses or birthing their, their um, deer and then abandoning them. It got to the point where like, 
the deer were like going under Mauna Loa Elementary School, dying there. And Molokai Ranch didn't do anything to retrieve these animals. Um, and then blue flies started to show up and became a public health crisis. And then, you know, none of the government agencies did anything. They just said, turn off the lights. And then the blue flies won't come into the classroom. It was pretty bad. Um, and around that time, I got involved. Um, but before I go into that, some of the things that we talked about, which actually became integrated later, was creating like a um, Molokai hunting club. And this was Justin Lua Falemana. He's the president of the Molokai hunting club. We interviewed him and he said, you know, let hunters be part of the solution. The, the problems that we have is we get a hard time going on to private lands. We have to do outlaw, we have to poach. So why not form a hui of hunters, get, get um, liability insurance and try and work with these private landowners. And so he began to do that work and form, form, form a, a Molokai hunting club. And when this deer crisis occurred, there were, the numbers of people joining the hunting club increased so much. So there's over 200 hunters that are part of this hunting club. And they first started to work with Pu'ohuku Ranch um, on the east side because their cattle ranching was getting compromised. They, all their vegetation was getting eaten down. And there's also prime forest land above Kuhuku Ranch that was being attacked. And so they asked the Molokai Hunting Club to get involved. And so they, they made a, a really positive um, <clears throat> dent in, in lowering the deer population there. And what, what they do is they share the meat with the community and they do a lot of community service projects. So uh, they really do a good job. Um, one of the things, you know, as we were looking at traditional and customary practices, it was really like one of the recommendations was with, to have those smaller fencing units and that each ahupua would manage their own. And they kind of use this analogy of the, uh, of a way of fishing, which is like, so this is the, you gotta think of the, the ave of the he'e, the legs of the, the um, octopus, as the a net, yeah, that extends out, and then where the head is, where the po'o is, is where you cinch the net. So you pai pai, you pai pai the fish uh, into the net, and then they, you chase them into into this circle here, and then you cinch the net. Uh, and so we we're talking about okay, we could organize community hunts in this way. The, the one of the um, recommendations from a hunter was to lay like um, cargo net, like to put spikes. And then on the hunting day, we lay cargo net in the shape of this he'e. And the hunters could drive the, the deer into the net. And then um, each ahupa would malama their resource on, you know, as part of their responsibility. Yeah? The overarching thing was, you know, when we look at cu culture, so culture determines the Hawaiian rights, yeah? So we said, look, when you look at the word kuleana, it means right, privilege, and responsibility. There's no English word like that, where rights and responsibilities are married together. And so we said, yeah, we had a couple system and part of that couple system was to malama, to care for the resources. And, and the ancient kupuna had to deal with conflicting interests. And so what, what they did was assert a couple system in order to ensure that everybody's interests um, and the replenishment and the, of the different resources would be ensured, yeah. So we kind of took that into mind and put that in our report. And then there was also, you know, 
from the Hui Aloha Aina o Mana'e group, they talked about, you know, including, not, not just looking at watershed management as protecting the upper rainforest, but really looking at it from an ahupua'a level and utilizing the people to do different things along the ahupua'a, all the way down to the shoreline with our local, local ia, our fish ponds. Um, and so these are some of the things that were suggested. Um, let me see if there's anything else. And then what we did too was we looked at the different vow, the these sort of zones, uh, biocultural zones in the ahupa'a. What we did was we identified their their characteristics, and what are the natural and cultural resources existing currently in these vow, whether the existing condition and threats, what different legal protections exist within these areas. And then what are the community management recommendations? So we did this for every vow, the vow akua being the top, vow kele being the, the second biocultural zone, vow la'au, the lower uh, forest, vow kanaka, where you have the human footprint. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, so we, we also included feedback from Nature Conservancy and then how we would implement these practices uh, as we compromised. And so what, what happened was um, they submitted a, a proposal. Uh, they, they, they basically lessened their initial proposal from fencing the entire East End to working on this Pakui watershed. So it was an extension from the Kamalo into several Ahupa up to the Ahupa of Makulehu. Um, but since that time, they've also gotten an agreement to fence an area where Pu'uhoku Ranch is on the east side, the far east side. Um, let me stop sharing now. So, you know, going back to the the more dire situation with the deer. So I got involved um, again in, I would say, I think the beginning of 2021. So the, we started to see the deer kind of looking really weak in the summer of 2020. And then when the rains were supposed to arrive, in the winter, we were thinking, okay, uh, the deer population is gonna recover. And hopefully um, by then we'll, we'll be okay. But the rings didn't come on time. And so they started to die even more. And so I was getting phone calls like, Malia, um, we, we need your help. We gotta figure this out. And so, Around that time, I had this dream. The deer visited me um, and they were showing me like my, they were showing, like first I, I, I saw my arm and it was like I went, went and looked into my arm and I saw the blood vessels and I saw um, the DNA strand in my body. And the deer were saying, Ivi o ku'u ivi, koko o ku. Ku'u koko, you know, blood of my blood, bone of my bone, we are one. And they, they showed me that through multiple generations of my ohana, that the deer was, had formed our blood, had formed our bones, and was one with us. And they said, you cannot think of us as invasive species anymore. We're part of you. And and what I felt was this tremendous love emanating from them. And they were telling me, your fears are true. Because of the way people are hunting today, our population is exploding and we've become weakened. And so you, you guys have to hunt Pono. And he said, you have to start killing us. 
you gotta call call the herd and and it's like you think it's bad for us but if you do nothing the rains are gonna come you they said you got we're giving you like two months to figure this out in two months the rain or rain is gonna come if you do nothing our bodies will be washed into those into these erosion gullies into the waters a healthy deer, what you think is the healthy deer are going to drink that water, they're going to get sick. And then you guys are going to hunt us and you're going to get sick too. And then this, our bodies are going to wash into the ocean and it's going to make the fish sick. Um, and so you got to do something. And they, they just said, kill us, you got to kill us. Um, and, and then they showed me like, so I'm part of this group, Kia Ikano Loa. I help to represent these uh, Native Hawaiian women who had been prosecuted under the Marine Mammal Protection Act for performing a barrel right of a deceased whale at sea. Uh, the federal agency claimed that um, they violated the Marine Mammal Protection Act by taking and transporting this whale um, and so my clinic uh, had assisted these women uh, in their defense. And we talked about, they explained to us that the whale are <clears throat> Kino Lao of the ocean god Kanaloa. And that what they had to do was return this Kanaloa to Paul to eternity by performing this barrel right at sea. And so, you know, without going too much into the case, in, in the end, um, the federal agency dropped the case when, um, when the Department of Commerce, which is the, the entity that kind of oversees NOAA, the federal agency that enforces the Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, when, on appeal, basically utilizing the arguments from my Native Hawaiian Rights Clinic, um, the Department of Commerce agreed that there were certain Native Hawaiian rights and religious rights that needed to be factored into the um, into the decision. So Noah decided to just drop the case. Um, but in this interaction with with these women, they explained to us the, the kumulipo and that in, in the kumulipo, you see pairings of, of animals or, and plant species on land and in the sea. So they explained that the kumulipo talks about the awa, which is a ancient word um, for um, the sandalwood, yeah? and that it paired with the will. And they say, when one guardian uh, falls, the other will fall. So they talked about the sandalwood trade in Hawaii coincided with whaling. And they talked about how the whales, uh, especially the humpback whales, they're the ones that sing the songs of creation. So they hold the creation, co creation codes. And they also sing the songs of the migrations of the Polynesian peoples. And, um, and so, you know, they, they hold a lot of importance in the Hawaiian culture and then our traditional and religious practices. And <clears throat> so they were saying like, uh, Kanaloa brings light into the world. But with the whaling, they use the whale oil to bring industri industrially light into the world. So it's, it's a lessening or a kind of desecration or corrupting of the understanding of the role of the whales, yeah. And, you know, the, the, the sandalwood is what protects the whole ahupa'a and the, the rainforest. Um, you know, it continues to bring that abundance, yeah. 
and the whales themselves are part of creation. Um, when you look at it scientifically, they create these like oases of abundance at the bottom of the sea as they, um, as they, uh, what you call, decompose, yeah, when they, when their bodies fall. Um, and then they're also seen as important uh, in the issue of, you know, carbon sequestration even. Um, and they bring nutrients from the bottom of the sea to the, the to the surface, which feeds a lot of the uh, phytoplankton. Uh, in Hawaiian, in Hawaiian understanding, um, their hupo, their their snot, basically house the um, the ohua, the baby manini. So the manini fish lay their eggs in the hupo, and then when the hupo reaches the shoreline and these these um, tide pools, when they the ohua the eggs hatch and break open and you see that real translucent manini. So, so there's these, a lot of these ecosystem things that are happening um, that show like whales are, are a major part of creation, yeah. So going back to the deer, the deer were telling me, um, you know, well, actually the, another thing um, these women told us is that the Kumulipo is not static. It's not a, a origin chant that was chanted a long time ago, but co um, creation continues to unfold. And, and we are responsible to haku that mele, to, to continue to compose that mele, that song, mele ko iho nua. And so the whales, the deer were reminding me of that. When they said "ivi o ku ivi koko o ku koko," you know, bone of my bone, blood of my blood, we are one. They're saying we're part now uh, of your creation story, at least on Molokai. Um, and so you have Kuleana, you have Kuleana to Malama, the responsibility to care for us, and. And now we are showing you that we are connected to the, to the papa, to the foundation within the kumulipo, which is the ako ako, the, the coral polyp. Because they say, you've been bifurcating your analysis on this. You're like, oh, the deer causing silt into the ocean, killing the reefs. Like one has to die in order for the other to live. And he's saying, no, if you take care of us, if you manage us properly, the reef will live. We are intertwined, we are paired. And this is what you have to haku into the mele, at least for Molokai. So with that, I'll just kind of leave it up for questions or comments. Mahalo. Thank you for sharing everything with us. That was a really amazing presentation and like the research. I don't know if anyone had a chance to look at the last session, but that brings a whole new element to it. Um, and we've had some action in the chat so far, but does anyone have any questions specifically for Auntie Malia? Yeah, I, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess like this for the island of Hawaii with the ungulates and, and rod spreading. There's, you know, there's, there's showing a lot of evidence that the ungulates spread rods. So how do, how would you kind of compensate or deal with the, the declining numbers of Ohia forests with the ungulate populations here on the island of Hawaii? I can't really speak to Hawaii, but I'll just speak generally, um, you know, or how I've been thinking about it on Molokai, because we want to reforest. Um, luckily, our our, um, our our trees have been resistant to rod, but it's it's really about 
determining what is the appropriate uses yeah in certain biocultural zones so like when i showed you guys the different vowel and what was the appropriate use in each vowel i think it's managing where these ungulates travel yeah and they shouldn't be roaming where ohia lehua is definitely not in that area um <clears throat> we're finding stuff like so I was interviewing some guys at the Nature Conservancy just a few weeks ago, and they were, they managed like the sand dune ecosystem. And you got a lot of beautiful coastal native plants. And one of the things they, they're trying to manage is the, the deer because the deer will, um, in, in, their own, in their poop uh, is the kiawe is, uh, seedlings growing from their poop because they eat the pods, yeah? So they, they're trying to just control the kiave uh, so that the, you know, and then hunt out the deer and put fencing up so that, the, so that this kiave doesn't proliferate throughout the uh, sand dune ecosystem. So, you know, certain of these ungulates may be pooping certain things that is affecting the the ohia lehua, but I don't, I haven't done research on that to know that for sure. But if that's what you're seeing, I'm just gonna go by your word. But there's certain things that you, you have to maybe be, determine different zones for. So like, I've been thinking about this on Molokai, like uh, I've been researching like Alan Savory's work on holistic management. So what Alan does is he, he, He's originally from Africa, and so he studied the behavior of the animals across the African savanna and their migration pattern. And he said they're always moving quickly. They'll go, they'll run because they got predators going after them. So they're running through the land quickly, and they actually, their hooves actually aerate the soil, and then when they defecate, it provides uh, nutrients in the soil, but there, but it's high density and and very quick movement. So what he did was he, for like cattle and you know other things that um, you know we people raise uh, live livestock that are raised commercially. He created this system called holistic management that mimics that where it's not, you get a big piece of land and they, they're roaming all over that land. It's more like providing um, intensified, uh, inten quick, like intensified grazing in smaller areas. And then you move them off to the next pot, um, the next, I don't know what you call it, but the next area. And so these animals end up having a healing effect on the land. So some of the things I've been kind of thinking of is like, okay, what if we created like a deer zone um, and they, we, we kind of fenced or managed it in such a way where they go from one paddock to the next, you know, and, and um, we got to try to figure out that a way that they don't go in these erosion gullies or we got to plant certain things that will prevent more siltation in these erosion gullies and then put like gabions in the stream to kind of further um, retain the soil as it's coming down the mountain. Um, so, and I was even thinking of like those land bridges, like what if we made some land bridges, um, like how they make over the, the freeway for migrating animals. If we created something like that and created certain zones where these deer can live appropriately, then we could um, actually um, utilize the deer in a healing way. When we we're when we we're on Molokai too, we interviewed one of the people we interviewed was Auntie Penny Martin, and she's a she gathers a lot of plants from the forest to make lei, and she's worked a lot with conservation people, um, and she. She talked about creating these kipuka. So she said like, you know, maybe the size of a house 
a, a you know regular three bedroom size house or something. Um, you create these small fence units. You weed, and she said she wanted to make like some of these control areas where you just weed out auto invasive and then see if within the soil itself there's native plants that pop up. And these kipuka would be, serve as the seed bank. Other kipuka, we would just plant native plants in that area and have it along different vowel. So people get ma'a, you know, they get used to um, seeing these, these little kipuka and, and falling in love again and creating that pilina, that relationship, yeah, with, with these native plants and have the deer go around them. Um, and then when we're ready to, to open up these seed banks more, open up this kipuka, we can use, use that as the kipuka as the seed bank for further growth and proliferation. Um, so one of the things that kind of impacted the way that I was thinking about this was, um, I, you know, every day I would be driving to work from Manai, from East End, it's like a 30 minute drive to, to Kaunakakai town. And I would always see the fish ponds along the short sh salt shore as I was passing and always looking at the silt in the water and feeling really hopeless. And so I was like constantly going, oh, what can we do, you know? And I, I think the kupuna took pity on me after years of asking this question. And so there was this sort of like, I had this real aha epiphany kind of moment. So I was, I was passing the, down this stretch. Uh, we call it Hannah Myers because Hannah Meyer used to live there, but the real place is called, um, I think, Keoniku Ino. And there's a fish pond in front of there, but you can't tell because the mangroves are like, is like a jungle and it's totally covered that pond. But I, when, when I crest that hill of Keoniku Ino, I always slow down because I know deer herds are gonna cross. And so, so I was like in my reverie of what can I do to save the reefs and the fish pond, but still have deer, you know? So then all of a sudden there are certain things, it's like in a split second, I had three different things happen to me. So first was, you know, studying permaculture and and I was remembering this video of this renowned permaculturalist, Jeff Lawton. And he was talking about how to make a chicken tractor. And he, he was like, what are the needs of a chicken? <laughs> you know, and he's like, oh, the chicken needs a place to roost. A chicken needs other chickens. A chicken needs a place to scratch, um, you know, and what are our needs of the chicken? Oh, we need a chicken for meat, for eggs, um, for the feathers. Um, so how can we fulfill the needs of, of, the, of the people and the chicken at the same time? So then he talked about this chicken tractor, like, okay, if you create this mobile, mobile chicken coop and you let, you let the chicken scratch and you make a roost in your mobile chicken coop. Um, they're gonna clear the, they're gonna clear the uh, soil for you. They're gonna fertilize it. They're gonna eat the, the um, fruit fry, fly larvae. And so now you're gonna have fruits without getting stung by fruit flies. Um, and then, you know, they're happy because they got all the, they're hanging with all the chickens and they're roosting and they're safe from predators. And then you just move the chicken tractor to the next spot. And then you plant where they were just before. So then what, the, what our, my kupuna was, my ancestors were telling me was, this was the methodology they use in the creation of ancient fish ponds. They said, okay, what are the, we, we see a problem here. The problem is our population is growing. And if we, if we continue to just, you know, pound the reef and the open ocean, we're going to run out of fish. So 
what what do we need to do? It's like, oh, we gotta eat the kind of fish that eat limu, like lower in the food chain. Okay, well, what are the needs of this fish? The mullet, the ava, um, oh, they like the sweet water. The sweet water is the, where the brackish water is, the mixing of salt and fresh. Oh, they, they like to eat limu. So like there's certain limu that thrive in this kind of environment. We gotta make sure we create something where, where the limu gonna thrive and where, where the fish get in this sweet water. And so that's how they ended up constructing these fish ponds around these springs and where, you know, an estuary kind of areas. Um, and so the fish got fat. They were able to, you know, at the makaha, just gather how many fish they wanted and the fish didn't want to leave and everybody was happy. You had aina momona, you had fat, abundant land. Okay, so, so then they're saying, what are the needs of the deer? Like, how do, why do you know that you, when you go to this area, Keone Kuino to slow down, why is it the deer herds cross this area? I said, oh, they're looking for water. How you no get water over here? Oh, like what, what do you smell every time you pass this area? I smell like this sulfur or stink fart smell. Why does it smell like that? It's like, oh, the, the mangroves are overgrowing and overtaking the spring. So now there's anaerobic bacteria, but still the deer know that there's springs there. So then they go and drink water at the fish pond. And that's why, you know, you got to slow down. He said, why don't you make fish pond on land? Figure out what is the de what are the needs of the deer provide this oasis for them with their the favorite foods and water. And they never gonna like leave. They're just gonna stay in that area and then you rotate them. And then, then you can begin to reforest in, in the more sensitive areas. So when the deer visited me in my dream, they said, you were given the answer and you did nothing. It's time you do something. So part of what I'm trying to do, like as, I, as I've been kind of assessing the issues of Moloka'i with the deer overpopulating, the deer going into private residences, the deer eating up the farmland of Hawaiian homesteaders, I realized that we, the hunting club ser serves a role in trying to get the deer population down. But the next step is the long-term management, yeah. And so this kind of deer oasis, deer preservation zone—I don't know what you call it. I gotta figure out how to do that. And so one of the things we're working on as a community is a purchase of Molokai Ranch, which is one third of the island, fifty-five thousand acres. It's the west side where we have the main major deer problem, but it's actually proliferating throughout our entire island. We're also working on a climate change action plan of, and we're finding with our sea level rise maps that most of Kaunokakai town, which is our prin principal place of business, and a lot of the east end residences, which are along the coastline, the, the east side is kind of like Haula, Hunalu'u, Laie, where it's like, narrow road along the along the coastline and the mountain is like right there. That's how East End looks like. So all our roads, all our houses are gonna be inundated. So we have to plan retreat and we have to heal this land on the West End that has been degraded. And, and we gotta figure out, you know, how we gonna better manage the deer so we can plant, replant, reforest, um, and we grow things also in the Baula'au, not just in the Baua'ku and the Baula'ahele. Sorry, doing too much talking. Do some talk. It's so great to hear your manao and, and your stories and, and just so 
beautiful your dream about the deers coming to you and yeah it's really really impactful it's kind of got reminding reminding me of a story that your friend and, and my boss matthew kamakani lynch has about his work in Baikekua on the back of Manoa Valley and how what he talks about is you know these these trees this alvesia in in the back of Manoa Valley or the deer on Molokai or the Kiave on the dry sides you know they're not rubbish and we can't treat them as such we can't treat them as just an invasive species and um and so he was talking about how the albizia right now in this restoration um, res restoration project in the back of Manoa Valley is now providing this kind of shade for the new um, koa and ulu and all this, these canoe plants growing under the shade. And so they're using this kind of guardian of this forest. And it's really got like, me reminding of like, you know, how do we, how do we approach these things and how do we value these species that are here and they're here to stay and how do we manage them in a way that it benefits both our land and our communities so i really really appreciate all of them and all you're you're sharing here today and, and how it's applicable to so many different species yeah i'm glad you brought up the work um, of matt um who's my dear friend and person that i you know dream big with all, all on a lot of different things and he's helping us also on the looking at ways we can purchase and own Molokai Ranch. But um, yeah, you bring up a good point. I mean, one of the things that we've been talking about is how, how can we uh, make commercial use of the deer while still ensuring that subsistence hunting um, is not compromised, yeah. So we have a lot of surplus. So some of the things, you know, in interviewing my, my cousin, um, Desmond Manaba, you know, he, he's able to do um, USDA um, monitored hunts and utilize the meat and sell the meat commercially. And he also does, uh, he also makes dog food out of the deer meat. Uh, I know there's a new business forming, I forget the name, but this, uh, this, this person knows how to kind of, um, work with the hides of the deer and she wants to make clothing out of it and, and different products out of that. You know, and, and talking to Justin Nuafalemano at the hunting club, he said he wants to be able to um, you utilize the deer commercially as well for food. Um, and he talks about, I forget that person's name, but on Maui, they have some, some commercial uh, like use of the deer and I think that it's principally for selling venison and if any of you guys ever ate axis deer oh my god the meat is so like sweet it's so good to me it's better than beef um, I was raised on that like that's my meat of preference to be honest um, but yeah I think there would be a demand for venison so long as it doesn't become so commodified that people cannot hunt uh, subsistence yeah that that's something we need to kind of monitor but there there is there are ways to utilize the deer yeah, I think that's that's the important thing is talking about utilization because it's not just saying like oh yeah let's just let like invasive species run and like destroy everything but it's like okay how can we manage this in a way where we're respecting and like using this resource, but also like, you know, giving space to like preserve the forests. So I think this is like a really good discussion to have. I think it's a huge discussion and I really appreciate you coming today to share your manao on the deer. Um, we're getting to 4.15. So if you have any final questions, please feel free to um, throw them in the chat, but I wanna honor everyone's time. Um, and thank you all for coming on a Friday afternoon. But yeah, if anyone has any last questions, please. I just saw the, I'm, I'm looking through the chat and the, the, they was talking about the disposal of carcasses. So 
what we did do was um, Molokai Ranch created a pit and a Molokai Hunting Club and a Bow Hunters Club. They ended up, you know, depositing the carcasses in these pits. And then the county also created a pit on Hawaiian homelands. So yeah, we, we were able to kind of, you know, deal with the decomposing carcasses. So I, I want to make sure you guys know we, we did something about that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if there's any other questions, but mahalo you folks. Celia just raised her hand. Celia, do you want to go ahead? I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm in my car and aloha, mahalo, Malia. I loved your talk. I teach a course called Ethics, uh, Conservation Ethics and Environmental Justice. We're doing a section on the ethics of invasive species and your talk just resonated with a lot of the ideas in the in some of our readings but one that really gripped me from nature learning from the animals learning from the fish on how to manage uh the deer or the, you know what we regard as invasive you know uh species and so that very methodology of looking to nature to figure out how to control or to manage species is such a is such a great methodology and i don't see that necessarily employed per se in invasive species control uh you know strategies and i'm wondering if those kinds of things can be you know employed within agency work or at least bringing in that biocultural bio you know ecological work of learning from animals to learn how to con how to control native species right because that transformation of the species from being invasive to being part of your blood the kin everything is 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 huge and that transformation is something that um yeah i'm just wondering if if these kinds of methods do you think could be employed within agency work? <laughs> I think it could. Um, I don't know if there's political will to do so, but some of the other work that I've been doing is through the Ahakiole Ahamoku system. So it's a law that passed uh, in 2007 and was further expanded in 2012 um, to basically house, um, house this advisory committee within the State Department of Land and Natural Resources. And it, it was birthed from the principles of the ancient Ahakiole that created the Ahupa system. And it's predicated on utilizing place-based native knowledge to guide um, resource management in Hawaii. And while it's been sort of, there's a lot of political things happening on that forefront and it's not being utilized in a way that I think is proper. Um, really the Ahamoku Advisory Committee has been, become a rubber stamp for DLNR's actions instead of truly an advisory body. Uh, that's my opinion. Um, one of the things uh, me and some of my law students did was we helped to draft uh, rules of practice and procedure for the Ahamoku based on indigenous knowledge and methodologies. And we included things like the vow and we included things like the ancient uh, principles and ethics of the Ahakiole, which is to manage certain um, resource realms along a decision-making matrix that basically says to look at um, the existing problem in terms of, <clears throat> um, no, to look at the solution to the problem in terms of its benefits to present generations, um, impact to also to future generations and whether uh, it's incorporating, you know, ancient wisdom. Yeah, so um, I can, I can kind of make that available to NAV and folks for you guys to see the rules of practice and procedure that we we drafted and it provides these kinds of methodologies that ultimately the state should be following um, 
and how the AMAC, the Ahamoku Advisory Committee should be operating. Um, so it's on the books, but whether they use it or not is really the issue. And hopefully one day things will be less corrupt and we'll be actually utilizing these, these methodologies on the regular. Would you mind sharing it maybe with Michelle and she could pass it on to people? I, I would love to um, can, learn can, more about those guides and principles. Yeah, in fact, I can, I can just try put them in the chat now. Just, oh, great. Um, it seems like part of this is also about not only looking at new ways of seeing nature and species, but also the words that we use when we call things invasive when they're actually not. Some things are just non-native, but don't actually cause detrimental effects, right? I mean, Celia, you know this very, very, very small percentage of species that are non-native actually become invasive in the way that we define the word. So just calling everything invasive can make it really difficult to try to find a better way to manage something by putting that idea in people's heads. But I think it's also in, a, in some ways about science seems to sometimes think it's always right, but science isn't always right. And so we need a better definition of science. What is knowledge? What is truth? And when we start taking into consideration that there's a bigger world out there than just the data right, that we can come up with a better system and provide, I don't know, better future nature and ecosystems that work. Thank you, Michelle. And we are well over time now, so um, I just want to be considerate to everyone's time and uh, we'll probably come to a close now. So Huge mahalo to Malia and to all of you for, for coming out and listening to her manao and for all the great questions. Really, really excited that we did this today and grateful. So, Anya, do you want to say any closing words? Yeah, just thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Navin, um, Michelle Shui, for organizing all of this. Um, thank you so much, Auntie Malia. And Please feel free to join any of our um, coming virtual sessions or our in-person huakai for the rest of the month. Uh, we really hope to see you there. And yeah, if you have any questions about anything, you can email me or Michelle. And mahalo again to everyone for coming. <laughs>